very much for joining us. And today is April 12th. It actually is the 60th anniversary of the first manned space flight for those people who weren't aware of it. And um, I'm ver we're very fortunate at this meeting to have a presentation by Dr. Kerry Diodi from the Australian Space Agency, who is- Not quite doctor yet. <laughs> oh, okay, the doctor in waiting. Okay. Um, and um, it also is uh, probably one of the few space historians in Australia too. And um, tonight Kerry's going to be giving us a presentation on, the, on this anniversary talking about the, the first year and, on, in, in space, manned space, which is 1961 and aspects of it. And also um, please everybody keep on mute until the end and then we'll have a bit of a Q&A later. Okay, thank you, Kerry. I'd like to turn it over to you now, President. Yes, please, if you have questions, just put them into the chat or whatever, um, because I won't be answering them until we get to the, uh, the end of the presentation tonight. Well, welcome everyone. As Wayne has said, today is exactly 60 years since the uh, first uh, human space flight. And uh, for the last 10 years, this has also been known as Yuri's Night, a special celebration of Yuri Gagarin, who was, of course, the first man in space. Um, the symbol you see there, the cartoon image of Yuri, is the, uh, the Yuri's Night um, uh, logo. And so every year, the uh, Space uh, Society has a Yuri's Night talk, which is usually my privilege to give. And tonight, as I said, I'm focusing on 1961, the year that human spaceflight takes off. Although, in fact, to uh, explain why 1961 became that year, we have to uh, step back a couple of years to 1957 and the period of the International Geophysical Year, which was an 18 month period of scientific research focused on the, uh, the Earth and its relationship to the space environment. Now, both the United States and the Soviet Union had said that they would try to uh, launch satellites during this period but uh, quite frankly, the West didn't think that the Soviet Union had the technological capability to do so. So it was an enormous shock to the Western world when the very first satellite was actually launched by the Soviet Union on the uh, 4th of October, 1957. And that of course was Sputnik 1. <clears throat> and uh, it was an even bigger shock when just a month later, they uh, launched Sputnik 2, which had on board the very first um, living creature uh, to go into orbit, Laika the dog, who very sadly, of course, uh, died not long into the mission because of a malfunction of the thermal control of the, uh, the satellite. But the, as you can see from some of these headlines, you know, Soviets beat the world in the moon race, uh, Russia wins the race into outer space. So this was an, a very big shock in the United States. And uh, America's program had been uh, somewhat uh, problem, uh, problem stricken. They'd had uh, difficulties with developing the satellite and bigger difficulties with uh, the launch vehicle. And uh, trying to catch up to the Russians, the launch on, in uh, December, I think it was December the 6th from memory of uh, Vanguard TV3 was um, a rather catastrophic public failure with the uh, rocket uh, exploding on the pad. And it's important to note in all of this that um, the United States conducted uh, most of their space program, the civil side of their space program, very much in public where the Soviet Union uh, kept theirs very much under wraps. And so the West really didn't know in many cases what was actually happening with the Soviet space program. So uh, the Vanguard program was in lots of trouble so a crash program was initiated um, through uh, the Army Ballistic Missile Agency in Huntsville in Alabama, which resulted in the launch of Explorer 1 in January 31, 1958. So it took the Americans a few months, but they got a, uh, their satellite into orbit. And you can see the picture on the, uh, the lower left here of um, the team that developed Explorer 1. Uh, Werner von Braun, whose uh, team in Huntsville provided the uh, launch vehicle, which was a derivative of their Redstone IRBM. James Van Allen, who uh, provided the instrumentation for the uh, satellite that 
uh, detected, gave us the first indications of the presence of the um, Van Allen radiation belts. And uh, Bill Pickering, the uh, director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that actually developed the satellite. And for those of you not aware of it, Pickering was actually a New Zealander. <clears throat> As you can see, both the American satellites were much smaller in weight, uh, less in weight than Sputnik 1. Uh, the reason for that uh, primarily being that the Soviet Union had a more primitive nuclear technology. So their, uh, their atomic bombs were much bigger than those in the US. This meant that their uh, ICBMs had to be a great deal more powerful than those developed by the United States. So when they were converted into uh, launch vehicles, it meant that they had some very big brute force launch vehicles available to launch much larger payloads than the American um, uh, IRBMs and ICBMs because they were using, they had the smaller nuclear weapons. But the, uh, despite the fact that Explorer 1 was finally in orbit, there was a lot of concern in the United States that the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States in um, space technology, which meant they were ahead in missile technology. There was a lot of um, political argy-bargy in the US about um, the Eisenhower administration being asleep at the wheel, as it were, and not understanding or not uh, getting enough intelligence of what was happening in the USSR. And this ultimately, um, this American so-called Sputnik shock actually provoked um, the beginnings of the space race. So this was the Cold War propaganda competition between the United States and the Soviet Union that was effectively won by Apollo 11 landing on the moon in 1969 and is more or less considered to have come to an end with the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. But one of the important outcomes of the beginnings of the space race was the creation of uh, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration which people often don't realize was in fact the world's first space agency. And uh, <clears throat> NASA was created specifically to bring all the disparate civil or civil related space programs in the United States together under one, um, one agency to uh, eliminate a lot of um, duplication and that that was going on among the different services. Uh, so NASA's role became to uh, manage the United States civil program. And one of the very first things that NASA did was to um, announce that as sort of the next step in space exploration, it would be developing a human spaceflight program. This was uh, called Project Mercury. So, you know, NASA was only about a month old when um, the Mercury program was initially uh, announced. The idea was that Mercury would begin with uh, suborbital flights which would use the Redstone uh, launch vehicle again. So the same one that had launched uh, America's first satellite and then orbital flights using the Atlas ICBM. But uh, you know, <laughs> the Atlas development was actually fairly troubled. And this uh, rather interesting shot here is the explosion of one of the early Atlas tests in uh, 1959. <clears throat> so it wasn't until 1962 that the booster was um, successfully man-rated to be able to carry the first um, US astronaut into orbit. The Mercury uh, logo you see here representing the sign of the planet Mercury with the seven representing the seven astronauts that were selected for the Mercury program. And in fact, um, <clears throat> it wasn't, um, again, sort of the end of 1958 that NASA actually started its search for the astronauts who would fly the Mercury missions. There was a bit of discussion, uh, you know, about who would be the best kind of uh, men, and they would be men because there were no women considered suitable to be the astronauts. Um, there was some suggestion that submariners would make the best astronauts because they'd be used to working in confined areas. Um, race car drivers were suggested because they were used to danger and high speed. But uh, President Eisenhower himself actually said no, we're going to have um, test pilots as the astronauts. Obviously test pilots are used to danger and high speed and also testing out sophisticated um, aerospace technology. 
um, and they also, of course, solve the uh, potential security problems inherent in using um, using civilians that were considered a, a possible security leak at this stage. So the uh, the uh, astronauts were uh, selected in the early part of 1959. Thousands of um, uh, military pilots with the, the uh, suitable uh, credentials applied. Ultimately, it was winnowed down to seven. Uh, their names you see here, and I'm sure many of you will know them, Carpenter, Cooper, Glenn, Grissom, Shearer, Shepard, Slayton. Each one came from a different branch of the services. Each one was assigned a speciality during the Mercury program. The uh, image up the top left here, you can see when they were announced to the world and uh, at a press conference in April, April the 9th in uh, 1959. Um, <clears throat> and one of the uh, reporters asked, you know, who's going to be the first man in space? And Glenn puts up both his hands. People often forget that Wally Shirar also put up both his hands. So there was an enormous amount of um, competition between the, uh, between the Mercury 7 to, as to who was going to be the first in space. We often see them um, shown in their role as test pilots to emphasize that uh, you know these men were professional military officers. Uh, but probably the most famous image of the Mercury 7 is the so-called right stuff image where we see them in their silver spacesuits representing what they really were, the knights in shining armor of the uh, Cold War propaganda battle of the space race. The, the, as I said, the United States program very much conducted in the public eye. The Mercury astronauts were constantly depicted as a cohesive group, even though we know, of course, there were many rivalries and that uh, behind the scenes, very often uh, depicted in their civilian clothes to emphasize that Mercury was a civilian program. In fact, I can't think off the top of my head of an image where we would sit, where we saw them all in their, uh, you know, one of these early promotional images where we see them all in their military uniforms. Um, and even when they've been on their survival training, they're still being presented as that band of brothers. This was very important to the, the picture that NASA wanted to present. The, uh, the astronauts, in fact, became um, very publicly known in the United States through a contract that NASA entered into, which gave Life magazine exclusive access to the Mercury astronauts and also to their families. So it wasn't just the men who became quite famous, but the, uh, the astronauts' wives as well were featured their stories in Life magazine. So the Mercury program, um, you know, it's sometimes said the, the astronauts were sort of uh, painted as heroes before any of them had ever flown into space. Whoop. They had uh, at the <clears throat> Langley Research Center in Virginia, they had uh, quite a range of, um, uh, testing equipment, training equipment, the uh, just a couple of examples here, the so-called Mastiff, the multi-axis trainer that uh, helped the astronauts become um, accustomed to controlling a potentially spinning or gyrating out of control spacecraft and how to bring it back under control. This is what it looks like when it, it's um, not in use and the lights on this show you the, the dazzling number of ways it can be spun while it's in use. Centrifuge, uh, training simulators, the astronauts had access to aircraft for zero G training flights, water uh, egress simulation. So here's John Glenn getting out of the nose cone or the, uh, can't really call it a nose cone, but the top of a uh, Mercury spacecraft to, and that was the original plan was that uh, the astronauts would in fact um, egress the Mercury after it landed through a hatch in the, in the top of the vehicle. It was actually quite awkward. And so there was a lot more interest in creating a hatch that the astronauts could exit through the side of the craft just as they were uh, put into the spacecraft. And that's going to have a sequel in, uh, in our story. Now, meanwhile, the, uh, you know, in public glare, the Mercury astronauts are training for their first space flight over in the Soviet Union um, under great secrecy. <clears throat> Almost exactly a year later from when NASA started selecting the Mercury astronauts, uh, the Soviet Union began its search for astronaut candidates. 
Now, ultimately in um, early 1960, they selected a group of 20 um, uh, cosmonauts. Now, this picture you see here, there's no known photo of all 20. And the picture you see here is of uh, 16 of them, plus uh, uh, Sergei Korolev, you see here, the chief designer, a man who was totally anonymous during his life. He was considered such a state secret and some of the uh, training personnel for the, uh, for the cosmonauts. But um, you may not know some of the names you see listed at the bottom. And that's because these men um, washed out of the program for one way or another at different times. And because of that, they became non-persons. So they were never mentioned uh, publicly until the 1980s and into the 90s with, uh, with Glasnost, the new openness of the Soviet and then Russian system. At the time, we didn't know any cosmonauts until they made a flight. The names of individual cosmonauts were only released after they had successfully accomplished um, a space flight. Now that uh, group was selected in February of 1960. And then around the middle of 1960, a smaller group known as the Vanguard Six was selected. And we see them here, again with the uh, Korolev and uh, some of the trainers. And this group was um, the forerunners, the front runners, of the training of the original, um, the original twenty, and they were going. They were selected as being the men who would fly the very first missions in the Vostok program. Vostok uh, means east, so of course a uh, a rather uh, propaganda loaded name for the uh, the program. Now, so they went into a, a very intensive training program. We can see them here, looking at the ejector seat. That um, is how they actually. Uh, came out of the Vostok, pro, uh, Vostok spacecraft during re-entry. The uh, Russians didn't have a lot of confidence initially in the retro systems for the Vostok, and they were very much concerned that it might impact the ground too heavily and the astronauts might sustain some injury. So they developed this uh, ejector seat system that um, meant that the, the cosmonaut would actually bail out at... Um, Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was about four kilometers and uh, come down uh, separately on a parachute. So while all this was going on, the Soviet Union, as I said, they've not admitted to even having a cosmonaut program, but they're sort of readying um, the uh, people for the idea of space flight, human space flight with a lot of propaganda posters like these. This one I love, it says, you know, we will, <clears throat> Uh, we were born to make the dream come true. That is the dream of space flight. And, um, you know, this one is sort of saying, let, let us conquer space. Let's go ahead and conquer space. So the, uh, the Russians were building up to indicate that they had human space flight in mind. Um, another picture here of the, again, the uh, Vanguard 6 with the booster, the Vostok uh, launcher, which is based on the uh, Semyorka, the type of rocket that was originally used to launch Sputnik 1, and which, as I mentioned earlier, was actually a converted ICBM. And in the background, you can actually see a Vostok spacecraft under construction as well. Now, I mentioned about the, um, the fact that the cosmonauts were not going to land inside their spacecraft. They're going to parachute out separately. So parachute training became a very important part of the cosmonaut um, uh, training process. Uh, and in fact, it's said that Gagarin actually didn't like the, uh, the parachute training. That was his least favorite part. Now, the what we know as Star City today um, was only just starting construction when the cosmonaut core was formed. So a lot of the early training that the cosmonauts did centered around all well, their parachute training, a lot of physical training to keep them in good shape, uh, some very rudimentary medical training that was available or medical uh, research that was available and quite a lot of um, study time. So they learned theoretically all the systems and all the, um, all the technology of their spacecraft, but uh, they didn't initially have the simulators in which to practice space flight, unlike the, uh, you know, the kind of uh, equipment that we've seen available to the 
Mercury astronauts. <coughs> Excuse me. In uh, 1962, they actually uh, decided to fly one of the early Vostok prototypes with uh, some dog passengers on board. Uh, poor Laika, of course, we know, was lost with her uh, shortly after uh, reaching orbit. But uh, these two dogs, um, Strelka and Bielka, we see them up here again, Bielka and Strelka, they were the first, um, first animals to be actually successfully um, so 19, I think I said 62, sorry, this is 1960. They were the first animals to be successfully recovered from space. So they were orbited in a, uh, in a Vostok prototype. You can see they were actually um, uh, shot out of it to land in a, a simulation of the way that uh, the cosmonaut would be ejected from the spacecraft. And uh, I love this Soviet um, propaganda poster of the period, again, hinting at uh, what's to come, because it's, it says, you know, the way is now open for, uh, for a human. So the way is now open for a person to go into space. And here we have the worker cradling the two dogs that have safely returned from space. So... The, um, the Soviets, of course, knew everything that was happening in the American uh, program. So they were starting to plan their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, starting to plan when they were going to make their first space flight around um, essentially trying to beat the Americans in the Mercury program. And so in, uh, in early 1961, three front runners from the uh, Vanguard Six were actually selected as um, the cosmonauts who would make the first space flights. So Gagarin, Titov, and Nelubov. And you're going to say, well, I've never heard of a uh, cosmonaut Nelubov. And that's because he unfortunately was uh, washed out of the program in 63 after having uh, blotted his copybook with several several incidents that um, came about because he had he had some personality issues. Um, he was uh, somewhat arrogant, somewhat argumentative, and unfortunately somewhat too prone to uh, to drink. And finally, there was one incident too many that led to him and two other cosmonauts being uh, being dismissed. So Gagarin and uh, Titov were in fact the front runners. And in March, uh, in some final tests of the Vostok spacecraft, um, on March the 9th, and then again on uh, March the 24th, the Soviets launched um, this gentleman, Ivan, Iv Ivan Ivanovich, essentially um, John Doe, although it literally translates as John Johnson. Uh, and this was a, a, uh, an instrumented mannequin. We see him here with uh, the different instrumentation inside, which actually included a, um, a tape recorder that played things like uh, Russian choirs singing songs and even read out a recipe for, uh, for borscht just to confuse uh, any Western um, spy stations that were trying to listen in on what they were doing. But the idea with these two flights was to uh, check that uh, everything was working with the uh, Vostok spacecraft, that it would actually be safe to fly um, a human passenger. In both of these flights alongside uh, Ivan, we had two dogs, Chernyushka, who flew on the, uh, the March 9 flight, and then um, Zvezdochka, or the little star, or starlet, who got her name, Gagarin himself personally named her, so she was quite famous in, uh, in the Soviet Union, and she flew on the second of the two flights. And there was some concern, actually, that the, um, when this mannequin, of course, was ejected from the spacecraft and landed uh, with a parachute as if it was a cosmonaut, that uh, if it was found, people might think he was, was a dead person. And so the um, uh, sign, uh, maket, which is the Russian word for a mannequin, was placed into the, um, in, into the uh, helmet so that anybody that found it would know that, in fact, this was not a, a person who had died. <clears throat> so at this point, 
um, just a little comparison here, you can see the size difference between the, uh, the Vostok and the Mercury. The amount of um, volume space for the astronaut inside the Mercury was about equal to that of a uh, phone box. And even with the rather large ejector seat inside the Vostok, there was still a lot more uh, room for, uh, for the cosmonaut to uh, move around. But uh, Mercury, of course, by um, uh, the end of 1960, it was obvious that they were still having problems with the Atlas. They had a bit of a tendency to explode rather spectacularly on several test flights. <clears throat> so they were clearly going to go with the suborbital flights initially as America's first space flight and what they hoped at that point would be the world's first space flight with these uh, suborbital flights from uh, Cape Canaveral. So reaching roughly 100, uh, 100 uh, nautical miles above the, uh, the Earth and down landing downrange around about 200 miles. So, you know, these are expected to be around about a 15 minute suborbital hop. The uh, first test of the, uh, the whole Mercury Redstone system uh, involved uh, a chimp passenger. Ham the chimpanzee, Ham standing for Holloman Aeromedical, which was the uh, center where he was trained. And uh, unlike the Soviets who, who liked to use the dogs for their uh, test flights, <coughs> the United States had always had a preference for using um, simians or primates. And uh, Ham actually performed quite well, even though there were some malfunctions with the, uh, the spacecraft and he uh, received a number of electrical shocks that he shouldn't have because he had performed correctly. Uh, he nonetheless did perform correctly all the way through his 16 minute flight. But um, they found there were various problems with vibration and pogo in the, uh, the rocket itself. And Von Braun was a bit cautious about um, launching a human being on the next flight. And he wanted to have another test flight, which was uh, slated to take place in mid-March. Now, just about the same time, as I mentioned, that the Soviets had selected their um, final group for the Vostok flights, America selected its three astronauts who would make the first Mercury flights. And this was Alan Shepard, John Glenn and Gus Grissom. Now, in fact, the decision was made in January of 1961 that it would be Shepard that would make the first flight. But when it was announced to the public in the February of 61, NASA only said these were the three astronauts who would make the first flights and they didn't specify which one was actually going to make the first flight. Glenn was, uh, in fact, uh, already quite well known to the American public even before he became a NASA astronaut. And so he was very much the um, sentimental favourite, the sort of assumption that he would be the first man in space. So um, there was a little bit of surprise when Shepard was actually finally announced as going to be the, uh, the person who would make that first flight. The uh, little postcard here, for those of you who know the story, uh, comedian Bill Dana actually had a, a character, Jose Jimenez, the um, reluctant Mexican astronaut. And the Mercury astronauts thought his, his um, sketches were quite hysterically funny and he became a good friend of Alan Shepard. So uh, he knew from Shepard before it was publicly released that Al was going to be the first, make that first flight. And what it says here, you know, eat your heart out, Al. We were the first, Bill Dana, Ham and Jose Jimenez. So here, this is actually Dana with, with Ham in a publicity shot. So when um, uh, Shepard and Grissom and Glenn found out that Von Braun wanted to do another um, automated test flight of the, uh, the Mercury Redstone system before the first human flight, they were actually pushing very hard not to go with that. They were satisfied enough with the results of uh, Ham's flight and they pushed quite hard to uh, have Shepard fly on that planned March flight. But the uh, senior uh, administration in NASA said, no, we, you know, we don't want, if there is a problem, you know, we don't want the rocket to blow up on the pad spectacularly with our first astronaut on board in full public view. So they were prepared to let Von Braun go ahead with the test. And of course, that is the pivot 
that then allowed the Soviet Union to uh, uh, make that first human space flight. But just before that happened, uh, someone unfortunately often forgotten now is this gentleman, Joe Walker. And he was uh, one of the X-15 pilots for NASA, so flying the, uh, the hypersonic aerospace plane. And just at the end of March, he set a new altitude record of 50 kilometers, 51 kilometers in fact. So he was the first person to get above uh, the 50 kilometer mark. And of course, sadly, he only held that record for two weeks because it was going to be broken by Yuri Gagarin. The um, Soviet Union was planning for this flight in May. As I said, they knew what the American um, plans were. The Vostok rocket and uh, spacecraft were taken to the launch pad in uh, uh, Baikonur, or what was called Baikonur. It was ac actually located in an um, uh, area called uh, Turitam. Uh, now you'll notice actually, let me just go back there for a second. The spacecraft itself is, is shrouded here as it's uh, being raised into launch position. That shrouding, even after it's removed, there's still a cover over the spacecraft itself, a uh, protective launch cover so that you couldn't see what the Vostok actually looked like. And for many years, um, the Soviet Union only put out these heavily doctored images like this one from the Canberra Times. This is the launch, but you know, it looks like they're launching a giant seed rather than a rocket. And you get uh, a lot of these early illustrations that look like something out of science fiction rather than the actual Vostok vehicle or the spacecraft itself. Um, you know, there were a lot of almost uh, fantasy images of what the Vostok spacecraft looked like um, for many years because the Soviet Union didn't want the West to know what their technology uh, was actually like. So it was only two days before the flight itself that um, it was announced that uh, Gagarin would be the one making the flight and that Titov would be his uh, backup. There aren't, even today, not a lot of photos available of um, the uh, pre-launch period of uh, the flight, but uh, here we have Gagarin undergoing some of his medical tests in his uh, pressure suit. Here he is fully suited up. And you'll note, you'll often see some pictures of Gagarin in his spacesuit but with a white helmet without the CCCP or USSR uh, written on it. And that's because they, the Russians literally realized at the very last moment that, um, you know, when if Gagarin arrived, you know, landing in, on a parachute, apparently out of nowhere, um, with nothing to identify him as a Soviet, the locals on the ground, wherever he landed, might think he was an American spy. So they very hastily painted CCCP on the... Um, on his uh, helmet so that it would identify him as a, a Soviet citizen. On the way to the airport, uh, to the airport, <laughs> pardon me, on the way to, this, to the, uh, the launch site, um, Gagarin and uh, Titov traveled in, uh, in a bus. As they arrived at the launch site, um, Gagarin's flight was only going to be an hour, but he didn't want to get caught short. He didn't have a way of urinating in space or in his suit. So he had a very quick pee on the tire of the bus before he um, went to the launch pad. And that's become one of the rituals of Soviet and Russian space flight. Even today, astronauts or cosmonauts on their way to the ISS, the commander of the mission, um, if, it's, if he's male, will um, have a pee on the side of the tire of the bus that takes them to the, to the launch site. Um, Female cosmonauts or female astronauts are exempt because it's a lot more difficult to um, uh, do this, you know, removing your spacesuit. So it's normally a male member of the, um, the team that will, uh, will perform the ritual. But here we see Gagarin walking to the, towards the rocket. Korolev is there. Here he is. There are many, you know, Soviet military uh, officers, uh, various dignitaries that were at the, at the launch. Here's Gagarin. Um, this is one of the few original images that was released of his launch where he's standing at the top of the stairs, just about to get into the lift that will take him up to the spacecraft. More recently, there have been a number of uh, 
quite nice color images released of um, Gagarin uh, entering the, uh, the spacecraft. I rather like this one. It has a good luck message here on the hatch that was written by uh, obviously the people on the, um, the, the uh, launch site. And this is actually one of my favorite uh, images of Gagarin. It's just before launch and he's it's taken from an onboard camera and you know he's contemplating the enormity of what's about to happen. He's about to become the very first person ever to leave the earth, go into space and in fact orbit the earth. And uh, when he took off at, um, was it 9.07 in the morning, uh, Moscow time, he said, uh, you know, as, as he took off, he said, uh, or um, which means let's go in Russian. And that's become quite a, a popular expression in the, well, in the Soviet Union and in Russia now, you know, when you're about to set off to do some uh, particular project or whatever, you know, let's go, just like Yuri Gagarin. We can see him here on um, some of the monitors that uh, the uh, Soviet mission control. The unlike uh, NASA, the uh, USSR didn't have a string of um, tracking stations around the world where they could keep in touch with Gagarin as he orbited the Earth. But uh, while he was over Soviet territory, they did get television from the spacecraft of him uh, in orbit so that they could keep uh, keep a check on him because one of the things that they didn't know at that time really was whether or not space flight, uh, you know, whether humans could survive space flight despite the obvious uh, positive indications they'd had from dog flights and, and the, uh, the chimpanzee flights and so on. Um, and there was a concern that in fact, being isolated in space could affect um, people psychologically. And in fact, um, <clears throat> Gagarin's spacecraft was automatically controlled from the ground. He didn't have, um, didn't have the ability to actually control the flight. However, in the event that something had gone wrong, there was a secret code put on the, uh, onto the spacecraft so that uh, he could free the controls and operate them. Now, a lot of, uh, well, not a lot of, but some of the ground crew staff felt that uh, it was quite unfair to send Gagarin into space without knowing what that code was. And they actually slipped it to him beforehand. So, um, had something occurred, he would have been able to, uh, he wouldn't have to waste time trying to find wherever the code was hidden on the spacecraft. He could actually um, take control very quickly. But there really was this quite serious concern that, you know, he might possibly um, go mad in some way. And so we don't, you know, they didn't want him to be able to control the spacecraft in case that, uh, that did happen. So here you can see the uh, Gagarin made not quite one full orbit of the earth. So that's 607, by the way, that's GMT. So it was 907 Moscow time. He, uh, so he traveled around the earth and then landed um, somewhat to the west of uh, the Baikonur launch site in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Saratov, I think the region was, that um, in the uh, sort of Western part of the Soviet Union. Afterwards, Gagarin said, you know, I, I could have gone on flying through space forever. He, it's clear that he actually enjoyed his flight. He uh, didn't suffer any ill effects. In fact, he, um, he was able to look out at the, uh, at the Earth. And as he said, you know, orbiting the Earth, I saw how beautiful our planet is. And he became quite, um, you know, quite uh, passionate about this idea of let's, not, let's preserve the Earth, let's not destroy it. He, um, he actually uh, performed a few experiments during the flight. It was about 108 minutes long. So he had a bit of time to, um, to do a few things on board, despite the fact that he couldn't maneuver the spacecraft and so on. Uh, for example, he was able to use a few tools very simply. And he was also uh, able to try out some space food, some very simple you know, to see if he could actually eat, literally see if he could eat and swallow. Because again, this was something that they weren't sure if he'd be able to do. So he had a couple of tubes. One was chocolate sauce. And I think the other one was meat paste that he, he um, 
got to suck on to uh, see if he could actually eat and uh, swallow. <clears throat> so when he landed, of course, he um, bailed out of the spacecraft and uh, landed separately. The spacecraft itself, this is an interesting shot of, of the, um, the actual re-entry module and you can see where it's rolled along the ground and the, the heat of the body of it has um, <clears throat> burned, a, you know, burned the path as it's come through. <clears throat> Um, when something that we didn't know until actually many, many years later was that uh, Gagarin, in fact, uh, had a fairly narrow escape in terms of his re-entry because the, uh, the re-entry module didn't separate cleanly from the service module and there were various umbilicals and things that were trailing and um, as the spacecraft was coming into re-entry, actually causing it to tumble. And it was only that fortunately early on at the beginning of re-entry, they burned away or broke away and the re-entry module assumed its proper um, attitude so that it could safely re-enter. You can see actually, this, this is the, the woman and her daughter who first uh, met Gagarin when he landed. But you can see this is a shot taken very shortly afterwards that he, he's pretty exhausted. He looks pretty wrung out. Um, he's already stripped off the outer layer of his spacesuit, but uh, the local uh, peasants who found him, they took him back to, uh, you know, one of the nearby um, buildings. He was given, I think, some tea and probably a nip of vodka or something and able to uh, tidy himself up a little bit so that when the rescue forces arrived to collect him, he was looking a lot more um, chipper for the uh, official cameraman. Of course, when he got back to uh, Moscow, the uh, Khrushchev was absolutely elated because here the Soviet Union had scored an incredible coup against the West by getting the first human being into space. So we've got Khrushchev here, here's Gagarin. Um, and Khrushchev made a great point of being seen with Gagarin quite a lot uh, through the, uh, the coming months and uh, years until, uh, until he was actually uh, deposed. So, uh, Gagarin had a, a massive uh, procession through Moscow. You can see the crowds here. Everywhere he went in the coming months and years, enormous crowds would always turn out to greet him. He was incredibly popular in the Soviet Union. And he was a very personable, um, very personable character in himself, uh, always smiling, very friendly. So he was, he was greatly loved in the Soviet Union and uh, quite popular around the world generally as a uh, representative of the cosmonauts. Uh, Pravda, the Soviet uh, newspaper, of course, its headline, you know, the, uh, the um, first uh, human in space. Here we, and uh, of course, in the West, the communist newspapers like the British Daily Worker were absolutely ecstatic. You know, here we have a communist in space. Um, the mm -hmm. What was that? The Soviet Union made uh, great propaganda play uh, with Gagarin. Here we have a propaganda poster that says, uh, "The son, you know, hail to the son of the the son of the party, or a son of the party." Um, it's interesting. You'll notice that when you see pictures of Gagarin um, or illustrations of Gagarin, you don't see him in his spacesuit in this period. Um, he's always depicted in a uh, what's actually a, a high altitude pressure suit. And again, this is because they uh, wanted to conceal the, uh, the actual uh, space technology that they, they had. Or else you see this picture here of Gagarin, which is actually taken during parachute training. In the West, of course, again, huge shock because America expected that they would win the, uh, the race to get the first, uh, first person in space. Um, I love this one particularly from the Huntsville time, the, at times, the uh, little caption here, so close and yet so far, size the Cape. Uh, you know, obviously the, uh, the Mercury astronauts were uh, very deflated at the fact that they hadn't beat the Soviets into orbit. This was a, a press conference on um, April the 12th. You can see a very dejected senior NASA management congratulating the uh, Soviet Union on the, uh, on the feat and saying, you know, well, America's going to get there very soon. Um, you know, Gagarin made it to the cover of Time and to the cover of Life, which is not a bad achievement in itself. So he really became this icon of 
Soviet space achievement. Again, there's a few more. Uh, just to give you a feel for the way uh, different countries were sort of recognizing the Soviet achievement. This one is actually the British Daily Mirror, not the, uh, not the Sydney paper of the same name. In fact, the Sydney paper of the same name, I couldn't get a copy of it, but they had a wonderful front page, uh, just picture of Gagarin and the caption said, Ivan up and back. Ivan, of course, being a nickname for, uh, for Russians generally. And I thought that was such a great headline. <laughs> But uh, they said they make huge use of uh, Gagarin um, as a propaganda figure to promote uh, the, the um, fact that the com you know, communist ideology enabled communist uh, Soviet science and technology to put the first um, man in space. And this one, uh, you remember that other uh, poster that I showed you earlier about, you know, we were born to, uh, to achieve that dream? Well, this one says, uh, actually says that, you know, we, uh, we achieved the dream or we made the dream possible on the 12th of April, 1961. Now here's Gagarin stealing fire from the heavens, stealing a star from the sky. Uh, you know, and these are just a few examples of the, uh, the kind of um, posters that were being produced in the Soviet Union at this time, praising Gagarin, praising the Soviet uh, system for producing the science and technology that could put a man in space. Uh, huge Soviets were very good at manipulating uh, philatelic propaganda. You can see just a few examples here. This is my one of my favorites actually. This is Hail Soviet Science and Technology. The first, uh, first man in space um, is from, from Soviet territory. Uh, you know, so on and on you get these um, constant reminders that the first person in space, you know, Gagarin was a communist and um, a lot of stamps and things that came out of the other Warsaw Pact countries and various uh, Soviet aligned countries. And in fact, this was a very important role that Gagarin then played was to visit a lot of countries around the world particularly like this is uh, this is in Warsaw. So a lot of Warsaw Pact countries, in fact, uh, other communist countries like Cuba, non-aligned countries, um, very much trying to sway them into the Soviet orbit. So here they are in, um, in uh, India. And this is, by the way, uh, Gagarin's wife, Valentina. And uh, there are actually a number of um, images of her in the Soviet press, a bit like the Americans wanting to portray the Mercury astronauts as good family men. So the Soviet Union also wanted to portray Gagarin as a, uh, you know, a good husband and father, uh, which he was, although he was unfortunately in his fame, he did start to um, chase, the, uh, chase the women a bit. And there's a lot of other stories in that. Gagarin was actually invited to Britain by the uh, communist workers in um, Manchester. And so it wound up that the, when he accepted, the British government then had to turn it into a state visit. And they actually provided Gagarin with a, a Rolls Royce. You can see him here. Even had its own license plate, YG1, Yuri Gagarin 1. Uh, the British Interplanetary Society presented him with its uh, gold medal of achievement. When he visited Italy, Gina Lola Brigida, the quite famous movie star of the period, who apparently uh, had the hots for Gagarin a bit. And this was quite a famous photo at the time of her uh, kissing him during uh, a visit there. This is quite interesting too. Gagarin never came to Australia. Um, Prime Minister Menzies, a very fervent anti-communist, wouldn't have him in the country, although the mayor of Sydney, for example, wanted to invite Gagarin here. But uh, Wilfred Burchett, who was an Australian uh, journalist, and the first Western journalist to actually interview Gagarin in Moscow, his father um, presented Gagarin with a, uh, a boomerang um, as a symbol of, uh, you know, a boomerangs travel and return to you. And so this was a symbol for Gagarin and future cosmonauts to travel into space and return safely to the earth. So, Back in the United States, we've already said they were quite devastated by the fact that the um, uh, Russians had got there first, that Gagarin had made that first flight. But nonetheless, the Mercury pro program pushed on. And uh, Alan Shepard, as we already know by this time, 
was uh, going to make that first flight. I've just thrown this photo in here because it's one you don't see very often. And this is how they made the molds for the seats that the astronauts would have in the Mercury spacecraft. Every, every seat was um, custom made for the particular astronaut. So they made, the, they made a, a latex mold and then from that a fiberglass mold for the seat. And this is Shepard actually trying out his seat for comfort before it was fitted into the, uh, the spacecraft itself. His uh, flight time was uh, just over 15 minutes. As I said, this is going to be a suborbital flight. So he took off at uh, 9.34 in the morning and uh, 15 minutes later, so 9.49 or so, he was uh, landing in the ocean. The, uh, you'll notice here it mentions periscope visual observation, periscope deploy and so forth. Um, the <clears throat> initial version of the Mercury that um, Shepard was flying didn't have the uh, larger window that the later craft had. He only had a couple of very small portholes. And so for him to actually be able to see out, he ha they had this uh, periscope arrangement so that um, he could look through the periscope to uh, observe the Earth. And uh, although um, he said, you know, oh, the Earth looks beautiful, you know, uh, words to that effect, he was actually only seeing the Earth in, in um, something of a grey tone because there was a, an optical filter on the periscope that he was supposed to um, change them around. But because he was afraid of knocking the um, launch escape tower jettison switch, he found it was difficult to avoid hitting that while he was trying to change these, um, these filters. And so in the end, he left it in, which meant he actually saw the world in, in gray tone rather than in color as uh, Gagarin and, and the later astronauts and cosmonauts would. So a lot of the rituals that um, American astronauts go through, just as Soviet cosmonauts sort of followed everything that Gagarin did as the rituals of their pre-flight, um, a lot of what Shepard did in, on his first flight became the rituals for American astronauts. And that started with the, uh, the pre-flight breakfast, even though for Shepard's flight, because it was planned for him to be launched um, early in the morning, about four four o'clock in the morning, um, his breakfast was going to occur at 8.30 the night before. So here's uh, Shepard and Glenn as his backup, um, tucking into the uh, steak and eggs breakfast that uh, is uh, standard for uh, astronauts pre-flight these days. The uh, thing here, uh, which is interesting, is that Glenn, as I've mentioned, was slated to fly third of the initial trio. So it was going to be Shepard, Grissom, and then Glenn. But Grissom was actually considered to be too busy with the training for his flight for him to act as backup to uh, Shepard. So Glenn actually uh, was the backup to Shepard and then the backup to um, Grissom as well. So here's a couple of uh, nice candid shots of Grissom having his uh, medical exam. Uh, Grissom, pardon me. Shepard having his medical exam, being fitted up with the... Um, sensors for the flight itself because naturally the uh, the aeromedical doctors wanted to monitor all his um his vital signs again because we just didn't know how human beings were going to react to space flight and although gagarin obviously survived his flight the soviet union wasn't making any of the medical data available to the americans and uh, here he is being um fitted into his uh, spacesuit which uh, you can see there's the, the undergarment and then the outer suit, which was a modified version of a uh, Navy, I think it was the Navy Mark IV pressure suit. I love this photo where we have um, testing the uh, radio system to make sure that uh, the earphones and everything are working properly with the, uh, the phone actually plugged into a jack connected to the, the helmet. And Gagar... Uh, I think saying Gagarin for too long. Shepard taking it easy, you know, with his feet up on the uh, on the desk while this is all going on. So ultimately, at about um, four in the morning, four four thirty in the morning, the transfer van took Shepard from the uh, hangar S at uh, Cape Canaveral, which is where the astronauts uh, uh, did all their uh, their pre-flight checks and some of their uh, their final training, out to. Uh, 
the launch complex where he was going to uh, fly from. And this is in fact the same pad that was used to launch Explorer 1. The, um, <laughs> unfortunately for Shepard, he kind of had the same problem that Gagarin did because his flight was intended to be only 15 minutes. He had no, uh, you know, no urinary device in his spacesuit. And unfortunately for him, although he was uh, loaded up for the flight, um, it was then five hours or nearly five hours before he actually flew. So he's sitting in the spacecraft wanting to, um, you know, take a leak. And in the end, he actually had to go in his suit um, so that he, the, uh, the joke that he made at the time was that he was making the flight a, as a wetback, which was American um, slang for the Mexicans who swam across the Rio Grande River. And that tied in with that um, Jose Jimenez uh, character joke of um, Bill Darners. So while he's waiting in the uh, in the spacecraft for launch, back in mission control, we've got uh, von Braun keeping an eye on uh, what's happening with the uh, the rocket itself. Gordon Cooper was the Capcom, and there was a young man working in mission control who uh, you might recognise there. <clears throat> Excuse me. God, I'm sorry, my brain has just gone totally dead. And I'll have to come back to that when I think, or maybe you can recognize him. Green Kranz. Thank you very much. Brain just wouldn't function for a second. Yes, very good, uh, very early picture of Gene Kranz working in mission control. When Shepard uh, got up to the spacecraft, he actually did a bit of uh, kicking the tires as he called it. So he inspected the, uh, the Mercury capsule before he, uh, he uh, was inserted into it. Rather, I think rather sweetly, um, Grissom came to say goodbye to him actually on the pad. And John Glenn, of course, was there also to, as the backup to help get uh, Shepard into the craft itself. Now, this is uh, Shepard lying inside the, uh, the Mercury uh, waiting for launch. You'll often see this um, as a vertical image, but um, in fact, it should be pictured as a horizontal image because he was lying, lying down inside the spacecraft um, prior, to, uh, prior to launch. The uh, names of the Mercury spacecraft, the astronauts were given the, uh, the options to name each individual craft. So obviously a nice um, patriotic and propagandic name, Shepard chose Freedom. The seven, all the spacecraft were known as something seven. And that again was something that um, uh, Shepard initiated as a way to recognize the, uh, the seven Mercury astronauts. So Liberty Bell seven, Friendship seven and so on. So finally at 9.34, on the 5th of May, uh, America put its first uh, man into space. The uh, Z 15 minute flight. So um, from liftoff here, they, they barely had time to uh, get him off the ground before he was uh, over the arc of the, um, the parabolic uh, flight and on his way back to uh, the ground. Now, 15 minutes isn't a lot of time, but it was enough time for um, Shepard to actually uh, practice maneuvering the spacecraft, trying out a couple of the different control systems that were uh, available, the fly-by-wire fly -by -wire system as well as the manual control systems. This is a uh, couple of interesting photos taken of him. This one actually comes off the in-flight um, film camera that was filming um, Shepard right through the mission to make sure that his, um, <coughs> excuse me, you know, that his reactions were, were good, that uh, again, even though they knew Gagarin had survived his flight, there was still a great deal of uncertainty as to um, what, uh, you know, how he might react to the flight. This is a, a photo that was actually taken, or it's a, a clip from one of the, again, one of the films that were taken during the mission. As I mentioned, Shepard couldn't actually see the earth in color because of the filter that was on his, uh, his periscope. Now, this flight was, of course, crucial to um, US prestige in the world. 
So Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy and his wife, and also Vice President Johnson and several other uh, senior uh, aides and advisors were all watching the flight uh, as it was broadcast in the uh, in the White House because you know had something gone wrong with Shepard's mission, it would have been a severe blow uh, politically uh, to the United States at this point in the uh, in the space race. Now, fortunately, the flight went perfectly. Shepard uh, landed in the ocean. This was the, one of the differences, of course, between the Soviet system and the, uh, the, the um, Mercury system was that the Soviet Union always wanted their cosmonauts to land back in Soviet territory, which meant they more or less had to land on the land, whereas the United States preferred to have them land in, um, in the water to give a, a softer landing. Um, so Shepard, um, it's actually when he landed, the original intention was that he would uh, come out, or the original plan was for him to come out through the hatch at the top. But before the mission, it had actually been decided that he would, uh, he would actually use the hatch on the side of the uh, spacecraft to, um, to egress. And the helicopter pilot actually lifted the spacecraft up a little bit after he'd latched onto Freedom 7 so that Glenn could, uh, Glenn Shepard could more easily um, bail out of the spacecraft without water getting into it. And that's important for the next part of our story. So here he is being winched up into the helicopter. Uh, the spacecraft and Shepard himself, of course, were landed on the aircraft carrier Lake Champlain. The, uh, back at uh, his home in uh, Virginia, his wife, of course, was absolutely elated that the, uh, the mission had gone safely, that he was uh, back safely. And of course, like all the Mercury wives and indeed the later astronaut wives through Gemini and Apollo, everything was done publicly because of the arrangement with, uh, with Life magazine. So here we see um, Louise Shepard, you know, absolutely elated that her husband is back safe. And when they finally meet up again, um, a few days later after he's been debriefed from the flight, you know, even their first sort of kiss of uh, reunion becomes public. Now, um, with Shepard, the, it wasn't, um, you know, it was a great achievement for the United States. They'd got their first man in space. It wasn't quite the, um, incredible over the top almost adulation that Gagarin received in the Soviet Union. But, you know, he was invited to the White House. President Kenny, Kennedy himself uh, pinned the NASA Distinguished Service Medal on, uh, on Shepard. They had a, uh, a parade through Washington from the White House through to uh, the Congress where he, <clears throat> excuse me, addressed the Congress as well following the flight. Um, because it was headed up by uh, Shepard there, but the other astronauts <clears throat> were also following. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, it became a case that the Mercury astronauts were uh, were sort of heroes before they'd even made their own space flights because of the amount of publicity that they received. Now Shepard, of course, like Gagarin, was uh, sent around to do a lot of uh, uh, you know promotional um, visits, both in um, the United States and abroad. But something that the Americans did, which the Soviets did not, because at this point they, again, didn't want the West to know about their uh, technology, was that uh, Freedom 7 itself became a bit of a star, being toured around the world and visiting um, different, uh, different countries. And this is, I think this is when it was uh, visiting Italy, as a matter of fact. So, after Gagarin's um, flight, but before uh, Shepard's, Kennedy, of course, was really concerned about the, uh, you know, how the US could make up ground in the space race. Um, you know, they'd, they'd lost out to the Soviets with the first uh, person in space. They had, you know, he was also under a lot of um, criticism for the fiasco with the Bay of Pigs, the attempt to um, remove Fidel Castro. So he was looking for something that um, could be done in the space area that would really give the United States um, an unassailable uh, technical achievement, an unassailable space first. 
And so he prepared this memo to the vice president, who was the uh, the head of the space council that advised um, on the uh, development of the space program. And so you know he said, look, what you know what can we do? Can we beat the Soviets by putting a, a, a laboratory in space, i.e. a space station? Should we look at a trip around the moon or landing on the moon? And uh, ultimately, the advice that came back to him was that probably the most feasible um, within a, a relatively short period of time, uh, that they didn't think the Soviets would be able to uh, catch them on, was um, either a mission around the moon or better yet, a, a landing a man, landing people on the moon. And so only a couple of weeks, three weeks after um, uh, Shepard's flight, we have Kennedy making on May 21st that very bold commitment. I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And that, uh, that declaration on May the 21st, 1961, is what set the Apollo program in motion. So it actually changed the entire course of the US space program because it, it changed the, uh, the way the rest of the Mercury program would be conducted. It led to the introduction of the Gemini program, which was something that had not originally been planned so that they could test out all the techniques that would be needed for Apollo. And then ultimately, of course, the Apollo program itself that uh, culminated in Apollo 11. So it's 1961 that is really this pivotal year, um, you know, and, and the fact that in a sense, the fact that the Soviets beat the United States to the first um, human space flight really um, created the conditions that then um, launched the Apollo program and the, uh, the moon program, which hadn't really been directly in mind at this, uh, this period. <clears throat> so to keep up the momentum from, um, you know, the Apollo declaration and uh, uh, the achievements of Shepard's uh, initial flight, the second Mercury suborbital flight was planned for July 21, 1961. And of course, as it just so happens, that's uh, nine years before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. So this was going to be Virgil Grissom's first flight. And uh, just a few interesting photos that I found when preparing this talk. Uh, this is actually uh, Grissom during some um, uh, water egress training, uh, a bit ironical this photo with him in his, um, his raft here, given what uh, did happen at the end of his mission. Interesting shot here too of him um, just coming out of a simulation. They actually had a uh, space altitude simulation chamber it, at uh, Hangar S in, uh, at uh, Cape Canaveral. And so the astronauts would do a lot of uh, final training in this uh, simulation chamber. And here's uh, Grissom just coming out of one of these, one of these training runs. This is a rather interesting image too of the, the astronauts had accommodation at um, Hangar S and you can see it was some fairly Spartan bunk style accommodation. He's Grissom just uh, relaxing prior to his mission in the, uh, the astronaut quarters there. His uh, spacesuit was actually a, an improved version from the one that uh, was worn by uh, Shepard. And uh, you'll see one of the things added to it was this mirror. And the reason for the chest mirror was that when he was lying down in the uh, in his seat in the spacecraft, that could then reflect an image that was, uh, you know, what was being seen through the uh, through the newly added mirror uh, window. So remember, the previous um, Mercury version had had the two little portholes, and Liberty Bell Seven was the first to actually have this large window that it was possible for the uh, for the astronaut to uh, see out of. Uh, again, Grissom was, uh, you know, taken out to the launch pad in the early hours of the morning and in fact uh, earlier I think even than Shepard's flight because Grissom was finally launched at six o'clock uh, or about 6.30 actually in the morning. Um, he'd had a couple of uh, false starts where they, the uh, flight had been delayed due to uh, bad weather. But uh, one thing they did do for him this time 
was to prevent the uh, incident of him having to pee inside his spacesuit, he was actually fitted with a urine collection device, which was essentially a, a glorified oversized condom um, so that uh, if he was on the pad for a while, he could at least relieve himself without uh, winding up, uh, you know, getting wet all down the back. Now, Grissom named his spacecraft Liberty Bell 7 after the, uh, the symbol of American uh, democracy, the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. And uh, this white streak you see is not an, uh, a problem in the uh, photo itself. It was actually painted onto the spacecraft to represent the crack in the Liberty Bell um, itself. And of course, uh, a lot of people made some rather bad jokes after uh, the spacecraft was lost that um, this is where the water had uh, had seeped in. But uh, it was intended to symbolize the, uh, the crack in the Liberty, uh, Liberty Bell itself. This is a rather nice shot of Shepard in uh, the Mercury Mission Control, where he was actually, having been the only American with spaceflight experience, he was now the Capcom for um, Grissom's flight. Uh, Grissom himself actually uh, said later that before the flight, he had felt a little scared, not, um, how should we put it, not, not scared in a, a, a really terrified way, but just concerned that he didn't know what he was actually going to feel like when the, uh, when the flight actually occurred. But that was uh, in some quarters used against him um, later, uh, particularly, I'm sure some of you will know Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, and the film that was based on it, which rather uh, paints Grissom as somewhat, uh, somewhat incompetent and um, actually sort of cowardly almost. And uh, that story was kind of built up on his honest expression that he had felt scared before the flight. But, uh, you know, this man was a very accomplished test pilot. He was certainly not a coward of any sort. Um, interesting, this is a shot taken not long before the launch itself. And, you know, it's pretty amazing the number of people who are fairly close to the spacecraft at this, uh, this time. When you consider how far people were away from the Gemini, the, uh, particularly the Apollo and, and space shuttle launches, you know, here they are virtually right beside the rocket until almost the, uh, the last minute. Now, a lot of uh, Grissom's actual flight was very similar in, in uh, what he was what he was doing during his 15 minutes to uh, Shepard's previous flight. He did try out uh, some new control systems that were fitted to the Gemini, uh, to the uh, Mercury, something uh, that was new for his version of the Mercury that hadn't been installed on uh, Shepard's vehicle and something that they would go on to use in the orbital Mercury flights. He was also able to uh, take photos out the, uh, out the window, actually see the earth in color. Interestingly, he uh, found it difficult to, um, while he could see, you know, discern land mass and so forth, he said that visually he found it difficult to um, identify sort of areas on the ground. He couldn't spot specific places that he recognized um, uh, during the, uh, the flight. But uh, this was the start, if you like, of American space uh, astronaut photography during the, uh, the Liberty Bell 7 mission. Unfortunately for Grissom, although the flight itself went um, pretty much straightforward, after he uh, landed, things kind of went, um, went awry. The uh, sea was a bit rough, there's sort of swells and uh, Grissom actually um, wanted to take a few minutes to write up some notes before the recovery crew came to, uh, to pick him up. When they did, um, of course, the helicopter latched on to the uh, spacecraft. They dropped down the um, so-called horseshoe collar to pick Grissom up as well. But um, he hadn't at that point said that he was ready to, uh, to exit the spacecraft. And suddenly the hatch blew off took everybody by surprise. Um, almost immediately afterwards, Grissom sort of tumbled out of the spacecraft because water had begun pouring in. Those swells very quickly came up over the, the lip of the spacecraft. So Grissom um, 
um, came out of the spacecraft because he was quite afraid that he might uh, might get trapped in there if it filled with water and sank very quickly. Um, unfortunately, when he did that, he forgot to um, close one of the inlet valves on his uh, suit. And he also had some trouble with the, the neck dam, which you can just see here on the, the collar that was designed to keep water out of the suit. So very quickly, he found himself um, struggling a bit because his suit was beginning to fill with water. And at the same time, the helicopter was being pulled down uh, towards the ocean because the uh, Liberty Bell 7 was becoming heavier and heavier, filling with, uh, with water. And in fact, they had to call in a separate helicopter to pick up Grissom while they were trying to see if they could um, uh, save Liberty Bell 7. In the end, they had to cut it free because it was pulling the helicopter right down into the water. And in fact, when the, with the two helicopters there and um, Grissom struggling with water getting into his suit, he actually almost, uh, almost drowned before he was um, picked up and brought back, to, uh, brought back to the carrier. It's a little bit unfortunate. This photo, again, um, uh, makes him look a little bit woebegone and it's often, uh, you know, often again said, oh, you know, he, uh, he kind of sort of failed in the mission and here he is, you know, looking really um, uncomfortable and guilty because he lost, or, you know, the spacecraft was lost. But in fact, as Grissom always maintained, and there's quite a lot of evidence that the, uh, the explosive bolts on the hatch, and this was a, a new type of hatch, it hadn't been used previously on uh, Shepard's spacecraft, and it was something that they were trying out to use for the orbital missions. Um, the hatch uh, blew and for no obvious reason, there were a lot of, um, you know, afterwards people saying, oh, he must have accidentally, uh, you know, oh, either deliberately or accidentally hit the, um, the manual um, plunger that would blow the explosive bolts. And uh, Grissom always maintained that he didn't. And in fact, um, Wally Shira in uh, his flight actually made the point that if Grissom had um, hit the plunger to uh, blow the, the hatch himself, he'd have wound up with a bruise on his hand because Shira had to do that. And he had a, a quite noticeable bruise on his hand from having to, um, having to hit that plunger. And Grissom didn't have that bruise and so, uh, Girard, you know, would always say later that he was absolutely convinced that Grissom had not blown the hatch. And those kind of explosive hatches, they were the same type, uh, or used the same technology as was used on um, the ejector seats for uh, American aircraft, uh, aircraft, you know, which would blow the hatch so that the uh, seat could eject. And uh, those types of hatches um, were known on occasions to um, uh, activate themselves, shall we say. So, um, NASA obviously accepted that Grissom was not to blame for the hatch uh, blowing because after all, he was then made the commander of the first test flight of the Gemini program and the first test flight of the Apollo program. So NASA obviously had confidence in Grissom as a, uh, you know, as a competent um, astronaut. The, uh, afterwards, he actually made a bit of a joke here. This is the, the boot of his shoe. He's tipped it up to... Uh, uh, literally tipped the water out of it that had um, drained into the bottom of the, uh, the shoe. And uh, here he was actually on a phone call after the mission to um, President Kennedy, who wanted to be assured that Grissom was safe after the loss of the, uh, the spacecraft. And in fact, even though uh, Liberty Bell did sink, um, it, still, it still set the stage for what they called the full orbit shot. So in other words, what would be John Glenn's flight, the first American orbit of the Earth. Now, Liberty Bell sank in an area where, you know, there was quite a deep underwater chasm and it was thought that it would be lost forever. But in 1999, an expedition actually, after 13 years of searching and effort, found the Liberty Bell 7 and uh, recovered it from, I think it was about four kilometres down. So it's a pretty amazing feat in itself to find it because, um, you know, the Mercury spacecraft is a pretty small capsule. So it was brought back to the surface, um, taken to the Kansas Cosmosphere, 
where it was actually uh, restored and you can see it on display there today. And among the things that they found in the uh, spacecraft during the restoration were a number of these uh, Liberty dollars, which, um, sorry, Liberty dimes, which apparently um, Grissom and indeed uh, some of the uh, pad crews had uh, believed to have uh, put on board so that they could recover them later as souvenirs of the flight. So Grissom has set the stage now for um, the uh, Mercury orbital missions, which are going to come eventually in 1962. But the final major space flight of uh, 1961 was that of uh, the Soviet Union's second cosmonaut. Only um, a few weeks after uh, Liberty Bell 7, this was uh, German Titov in Vostok 2. And the big surprise with this mission was that not only was it not a repeat of um, Gagarin's mission, the Soviet Union went from one orbit of the Earth to 24 hours in space, so an entire day in, uh, in orbit, which was a huge leap. And in fact, um, it wasn't until the very end of the Mercury program that America actually equaled that uh, duration of uh, space flight. Again, there's not a lot of pictures um, or not a lot of images easily available of uh, Titov and uh, especially during training. But here's one that I was able to find of him during parachute training. A rather interesting one, uh, Titov was uh, quite an accomplished gymnast. And so he didn't like doing a lot of running. He didn't like the running training that many of the cosmonauts did. So in fact, he did a lot of uh, gymnastics training to um, uh, make up for that as an alternative. This, I'm sorry, the quality of these shots is not very good, but this is quite an interesting one. After his, uh, space, his uh, spacecraft was erected on, uh, at uh, Baikonur, he actually came to the site, and this is something Gagarin had done as well, so creating another, uh, another ritual to thank all the uh, technical staff, all the workers who had been involved in getting the spacecraft um, ready, for, uh, ready for flight. And he actually... Um, did this as a couple of weeks beforehand. A few, uh, again, a few not commonly seen pictures of uh, Titov undergoing his uh, pre-flight uh, medical checks. Uh, this, this is actually an interesting one because he's not being fitted with uh, his flight sensors here, but uh, apparently these were sensors being used for some of the pre-flight medical checks. On the way uh, in the bus, on the way to uh, the launch pad, Titov and behind him, um, uh, Nick, uh, get my tongue around it. Uh, my, sorry, my brain has just gone dead today. <laughs> uh, Popovich, who was his, uh, his backup. Uh, again, Boral Nelyubov got uh, relegated um, despite being one of those original three. He was not the backup for, uh, for Titov either. Um, on the way to the uh, to the pad, they were uh, Titov because he was going to be in space for twenty four hours. He was going to have to uh, to eat obviously during that time, so there were um, some space food meals planned for him, and uh, they were actually he and uh, Popovich actually tried out some of the space food, uh, some samples on the way to the uh, to the launch pad, and these are a couple of the original. Um, tubes of space food that uh, were carried on his flight. Um, this one is uh, gooseberry, um, gooseberry paste or gooseberry, sorry, gooseberry juice. And this one is uh, blackberry juice. And this was the important thing that they found, you know, over his 24 hours, um, Titov was able to, to eat without any difficulty. Um, unfortunately for him, he did experience space sickness he was the first human to experience space sickness. Although uh, one of the space dogs, I think it was, uh, I think it was Bielka, apparently um, experienced some uh, some space sickness during her flight. Um, again, not many images of uh, Titov uh, pre-flight, but I do rather like this one where he's just about to. Uh, bring the visor of his space helmet down before launch. And just like Gagarin, he's got that sort of pensive look on his face as he's thinking about the enormity of the, uh, the mission that he's about to uh, undertake. So 
As I said, it was a 24 hour flight. You can see he made uh, numerous orbits around the earth. One of those orbits passed directly over um, Washington. And during that uh, time, he uh, made a call, uh, you know, over the radio, greetings to the uh, people of the United States. And as this uh, little newspaper article uh, says, the you know there was indicates that there was certain concern in the United States, and it's you know U.S. officials adopt this "let's be calm" view because there was this concern that you know if he could overfly the United States, um, he could be either conducting um, you know secret surveillance, effectively acting as a spy satellite. Or on another occasion, it could be a weapon rather than a cosmonaut. It could be a, a nuclear weapon that was going to be flying over the United States. So there was uh, quite a bit of concern about uh, about this uh, overflight of, of the U.S. But um, yeah, so throughout the uh, throughout the mission, uh, Titov was able to um, to say he he, he ate, he uh, drank without any problems. He was able to. Um, take a number of uh, images out of the spacecraft, some quite, uh, quite good images of what the Earth looked like from space, this wonderful shot of the, uh, the limb of the Earth. He not only took photographs, he also had a, uh, a camera, a film camera, so that he was able to take film of the Earth as well during the flight. Uh, this is a view of the uh, Soviet mission control um, during, that, uh, during his mission. And uh, I rather like this one showing you how he was being monitored um, on, uh, through television cameras on the spacecraft. And then they were recording film of the, uh, the vision that was on the monitors as well, so that they could have a, a record of the flight. Because again, you know, nobody knew at that point, all right, you might've been able to survive an hour, but could 24 hours um, create more problems for, uh, you know, for someone in space, would they be able to function right through that time? And of course, across this 24 hours, um, Titov slept. Uh, in fact, interestingly, he, he went to sleep and he said his, his sleep was uh, disturbed by uh, something woke him up. And when he woke up, he realised his hands were floating in front of him. Um, but once he tucked them, uh, you know, under, under one of his um, support straps, so that they didn't float around, he was able to get um, several hours of sleep. So he became the first person to sleep in space. He, uh, <coughs> excuse me, carried out a number of small experiments again, um, you know, using tools to do small tasks to uh, see how well a person could work and function across that 24 hour period. Um, Interesting with his flight too, where Gagarin's uh, flight had been completely secret until he returned. Uh, you know, here we've got people in Moscow who were actually able to watch some of that television from space when he was flying over the Soviet Union. So actually see the mission occurring in um, real time. After his 24 hours, when uh, he returned, again, the, uh, the local people uh, actually flocked to uh, see the spacecraft after he landed. Again, you can see that, uh, you know, after 24 hours, he was pretty exhausted. He looks quite, um, you know, like he's been through a, uh, an experience, but uh, he made a call to the Kremlin to, uh, you know, tell Khrushchev that he was safe. And Khrushchev, of course, turned out to uh, greet him at the airport. Uh, <clears throat> around the world, you know, the, um, again, making headlines. And this one's particularly interesting, of course, you know, he's covered this, 434,960 miles, i.e. pretty much the distance to the moon and back. Uh, so the question's already arising, can the US still win the race to the moon? And this is only a couple of months after Kennedy has made the um, commitment to do so. Um, Ever the showman, this is, this is a great uh, shot of Titov, uh, you know, presenting himself as the hero. He was a bit of a... Um, uh, you know, say a bit of, bit of a showman, bit of a, um, uh, someone who liked to be the centre of attention. Because now having two cosmonauts, the Soviet Union uh, very often would have Titov and Gagarin together. Khrushchev, of course, always wanted to be seen with, uh, with both of them. Uh, individually and together, they did, again, a great deal of uh, 
propaganda touring outside the, the USSR and within the Soviet Union itself. Again, we're seeing these uh, propaganda posters that build on um, build on the fact that now the Soviet Union has had two people in orbit. They have the record for the longest space flight. Um, you know, uh, this is essentially saying hail communism and we've got Vostok 1 and Vostok 2. Again, you know, we're seeing the Soviet propaganda swing into action with the philatelic side of things. This is actually interesting. It's a poster for a documentary that was made from the film that Titov shot while he was in orbit. And uh, eventually too, Titov would travel overseas. Now, Kennedy apparently um, specifically said he did not want Gagarin to come to the United States because that would be too obvious a uh, symbol that the United States had, had uh, failed to beat the Soviet Union. However, by 1962, um, he was prepared to meet Titov. In fact, this was after Glenn had made his flight as well. So we have Titov and Glenn with Kennedy. Uh, he came for the uh, World's Fair that was in uh, Seattle at that time. And apparently, despite the fact that he could be a, a bit of an arrogant personality, um, it said that the Mercury astronauts uh, actually liked Titov and got on uh, quite well with him. So these are all the major events of uh, 1961, this pivotal year in spaceflight. And there was one last, uh, one last event that would set the stage for 1962. And that was the flight of the astro chimp Ham, uh, sorry, uh, Enos, in, um, to test out the Mercury Atlas system. Because remember, they'd had a lot of problems with the, uh, the Atlas. Um, and even until not long before Glenn's actual flight, there were still Atlas uh, rockets that were um, exploding rather than uh, completing their, uh, their test flights. But uh, Enos made a, a very successful uh, flight. It's a rather interesting picture actually of the Mercury capsule with Enos already loaded on board, being lifted up to be attached to the top of the, um, <clears throat> the Atlas booster. So the fact that uh, Enos made a successful flight, the Atlas performed really well. Um, you see the, uh, the release that uh, NASA puts out that, you know, this has all been good. So the next project Mercury flight will be, uh, will be the orbital flight. And so 1961, this incredibly momentous year for human space flight ends on uh, this high note for the United States that it will make its first uh, orbital flight in 1962. Thank you. Excellent talk, Kerry. Um, we've got a couple of questions already in the chat. So I'll just go back to the first one. It looks like Julian's got some information on the hatch. I, that, can you look at the chat or do you want me to try to read some of it out? Hang on a sec. No, you've got to pull your presentation. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. I've, I've taken that out. Yeah, I'm just trying to work out whether you want yeah. me to read them out or you maybe want to look at them. The hatch eject mechanism was examined and found to be intact, but had blown due to being faulty. Yes, well, that's right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, well, this was the thing that at the time there was, you know, there was a question as to whether um, Grissom may have accidentally uh, activated the hatch in some way. Um, as I said, Shira actually put paid to that in the end, because he showed that if he had done so, he'd have had that bruise from, um, mm. uh, you know, having to put the pressure on the, um, the plunger to actually activate the hatch. Uh, interestingly, when they recovered Liberty Bell, um, the hatch area was too, um, too badly corroded for them to be able to, um, pardon me, make any determination at all as to whether, um, you know, the hatch mechanism had been faulty or whatever. But um, it's generally sort of recognised now that um, there was some fault in the hatch and that Grissom didn't actually do anything that caused the, um, the hatch to blow off. And as I said, NASA obviously had uh, confidence in him because he was then named as the commander for the first Gemini mission and, of course, for the first um, Apollo mission. And, in fact, for those of you who don't know the story, the first... Uh, Gemini mission, uh, Grissom named his spacecraft Molly Brown. And that was uh, because of a film 
that was showing at the time, very popular movie called The Unsinkable Molly Brown, which was the story of um, very well-known American um, uh, millionaire socialite who had uh, survived the sinking of the Titanic. And so um, Grissom was kind of making a joke about the fact that, um, you know, he'd lost Liberty Bell 7, but he wasn't going to lose Gemini 3 because it was unsinkable, just like Molly Brown. Um, however, the NASA higher-ups actually were not, they thought it was being a bit too uh, flippant. And so after that, they um, brought in a, uh, a regulation that the, the spacecraft wouldn't have names anymore, that the astronauts wouldn't name them. And so it's not until you get to um, Apollo 9 that the spacecraft have their own names again. And the reason for that is that when you had the command module and the uh, lunar module operating separately, there needed to be a way to differentiate between the two so that the astronauts were again able to uh, to name them. Okay, what's our next? Greg's got a question about the, well, um, effects of space on astronauts to do with the um, isolation, yeah, disease. So, what was that? Well, little was known about the effects of space on the astronauts. Was it only with spacewalks that scientists began putting the astronauts into isolation for fear of diseases, or did that only happen with the moon missions? Um, if you're talking about putting them into isolation on return, that was only for the Apollo missions that landed on the moon, just in case there was some form of microbial life on the moon that, you know, we didn't know about. Um, you know, everybody assumed, and rightly, that, uh, you know, conditions on the moon simply meant there would be no life there. But just in case there was some kind of unknown microbial life that um, maybe could uh, act like a, uh, you know, act like a germ on people when it got back to Earth, that's why the astronauts were put into um, the Apollo astronauts were put into quarantine. But um, it was only for the first couple of missions anyway, because when it was obvious that um, the astronauts weren't getting sick and nobody around them was getting sick, uh, you know, they weren't bringing back anything from the moon. So um, there was no, up till that time, I mean, you know, nobody expected there to be astronauts to pick up any diseases in, uh, in space itself. The space environment was simply too, you know, simply too um, harsh for anything to be existing simply out in the void. Okay, was there any other questions then? Yeah, I had a question about... Uh, oh, were the astronauts living at Houston then? Um, no. And the, during the Mercury period, um, the space program was run out of uh, NASA Langley in um, Virginia. Ah. The astronauts mostly lived in Virginia um, and did most of their training um, at, at Langley. But for the final um, periods of their training, you know, I, th I think, and I'm happy to be corrected here, like for the last um, week or two, they would go down. Of course, they'd go down to the Cape at different times for training anyway, because they, uh, you know, had to familiarise themselves with the, uh, the, the launch vehicle and the facilities and everything there. So that they would live in this hangar S and certainly for the last, um, you know, the last few days before a flight, they'd be in Hangar S. Um, and this is the thing, actually, the astronauts were quarantined before flight because, you know, nobody wanted them catching colds and things. But, uh, yeah, so they, they'd live at Hangar S, do those last, you know, simulation runs and then go from there out to the... Uh, to the launch pad for the, um, uh, you know, their, uh, their liftoff. <laughs> what was that? Was MSC operating then? No. Um, the Manned Space Flight Centre, that we now call Johnson Space Centre, didn't come into operation until the uh, Gemini. Yeah, it was still being built, in other words. So um, Yeah, at yeah. that point. I mean, they only started building, uh, Ken well, what we know now as Kennedy Space Centre, um, about 1963. Mm, I hadn't thought of that one before, but that makes, that makes sense. Yeah, well, there's the, when I was putting together a talk last year, actually, I found a really good 
picture of the VAB in its very early stages of construction, you know, with this just these skeletal um, stanchions of the sides of the building before any cladding or anything had uh, gone on it. And, and that was sort of, I think, late 63 or something like that. And so all the, all the early, you know, the, the Mercury stuff was all done at uh, Canaveral, at what was actually called the Eastern Test Range mm. and the uh, Canaveral Air Force Station because that's where, you know, the, the um, Atlas particularly was, going, was being tested there anyway as an ICBM and the, um, uh, you know, Various other missiles, best, get my tongue around that. Missiles had been tested there since 1950. So people don't perhaps realize that um, the Eastern Test Range had been operating, you know, for, for 20, uh, 10 years before the uh, space program um, started launching from uh, Kennedy or from Canaveral, pardon it. And of course, as we know, it was Cape Canaveral, then it became Cape Kennedy, then it became Cape Canaveral again. <laughs> So yeah. Anne's got a question on German Titov. Did he go into space again? Um, Titov was um, a bit unlucky that way too. Um, he was actually put back onto flight status um, after his, you know, after he did a lot of his uh, promotional tours and things. He was put back onto flight status and he was involved in a lot of the early development of the uh, Spiral um, space plane. And he expected ultimately that he would become a pilot in that uh, program. But after Gagarin was killed in 68, um, the powers that be wouldn't let him fly again because after all, they'd lost cosmonaut number one. They didn't want to lose cosmonaut number two. He was still too great uh, a national hero. So um, he was taken off flight status and, and was never able to fly again. He, um, he remained, actually, he was a, a very staunch communist. And so even after the, uh, the end of the uh, Soviet Union, he actually um, went into politics. He became a member of the, uh, the Duma, the uh, Russian lower house, as a communist party member. So don't forget, even though the Soviet Union was dissolved, the communist party itself did still and does still still exist as a political party. And so he became a, a Communist Party member. Um, he, um, you know, I think he wanted to fly again, but the, let's say the powers that be just weren't going to let him do so. Interesting thing with, with Titov too, um, for a number of years now, there's been, you know, there's been a story going around, well, in fact, it goes right back to the 60s, that Gagarin said, you know, when he was in space, that, you know, I looked for God and I didn't see him. In other words, being a good communist, he was, um, uh, you know, an atheist. And, um, uh, you know, so he was making that, that comment to bolster, um, just literally bolster uh, the communist atheist um, stance. But there is some evidence that, in fact, like a lot of Russians at the time, uh, Gagarin wasn't actually a communist, but uh, but a sort of, how shall I put it, a, a Christian believer without being a deeply religious person. But uh, Titov was, um, as, as a committed communist, he was a committed atheist. And he actually claims to be the person that said this, I looked for God and I didn't see him. Um, and uh, apparently he actually said this during the, um, uh, while he was in Seattle at the, uh, the World's Fair, that uh, somebody must have asked him a question about religion. And he, he said that, you know, well, while I was in space, I didn't see God. And uh, Khrushchev rather liked the story and he did tell it. Um, but I don't know whether he attached it to Gagarin, like whether Khrushchev said it was Gagarin because that was a higher profile or whether people assumed, excuse me, pardon me, I'm sorry, whether people assumed that um, it was Gagarin who had said it because he was the first uh, communist, uh, but um, apparently it was Titov. Um, 
like Gagarin, you know, Titov went through a stage of having a, a bit of a drinking problem. He was, uh, in fact, he had a drinking problem for a while. Uh, and that was part of Nelubov's issue too. Uh, very sadly, after Nelubov was dismissed from the cosmonaut corps, uh, he, in 63, he actually committed suicide in 68. Um, I'm uh, sorry, 66. Um, walked in front of a train. Uh, he was drunk at the time. And although it was officially a suicide, it may have been just that he was so drunk he didn't know what he was doing. But uh, certainly he was very badly, um, uh, you know, affected by being kicked out of the communal, uh, cosmonaut corps. Uh, yes, that's right. Titov was the youngest man to fly in space. And thank you for reminding me, John. I knew there was something I needed to mention. Um, and yes, that is still correct. Although there's a... Uh, woman who's been picked for this civilian um, uh, crew dragon flight, who if, if she flies when it's currently scheduled will be younger than younger than um, Titov when she flies. So she will then um, take that mantle as the youngest person to fly in space. Is that the Axiom one or the other one? I think there's two private ones I thought that was going, there was an Axiom one, which is... Yeah, no, the Axiom one isn't this year though. Okay, so no, that, that's I think next year. No the, yes, that's yeah. No, no, this is the one that the, the, the you know the billionaire bloke has bought the bought all the seats. And he's deciding who has to yeah. go go on the flight, I think was the words. He, it, well, he's already he's picked the four people now that are. Oh yeah I, yeah, I hadn't seen the names, but I had heard about the story where he was trying to work out the the selection criteria, which is interesting in itself. Um, well, at least one of them was actually um, like a raffle. You know, you, you yeah. bought a ticket in this raffle and the money went to a charity, a hospital that he supports. Mm. Um, and then so the winner was the, you know, the person who's going is the person who won that, that raffle. Um, but the, the young woman, she actually, I, I believe, and I might have this wrong, but uh, I think she was a patient at one point at this hospital that he supports or she's associated with this hospital in some way and he selected her to fly because she she was associated with this hospital in some way mm -hmm. um yeah so if, if she flies when when that mission is currently slated she would become the youngest person Okay, so it says somebody said that she has a disability too. So that's what John has. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right because the St Jude's Hospital is one that does uh, treats a lot of people with, um, you know, with various disabilities. I got one question on the letter from Kennedy. Sorry, on what? Where did you find? Oh, where did you find the letter from Kennedy? I've never um, seen that before. That's an interesting letter. I've never yeah, no, it, it's it's. Um, easy to find on the internet. I mean, it, you know, it's well known and you'll find it reproduced in, in any number of space history books. Um, and yes, if, you know, just put in a search for, you know, Ke Kennedy Apollo letter um, and that should bring it up for you if you want to, uh, you know, want to read it in detail. But uh, yeah, you know, Kennedy was really concerned about finding something that America could claim as its own, as the thing it was going to do that would, um, you know, just just um, overtop any achievement that the Soviet Union was likely to uh, to make. Because at, at that point in the space race, especially because, you know, the Soviet Union simply hid all their failures. You know, they just didn't announce anything that didn't work. So, um, you know, if the rocket blew up, well, it, it just never happened. Um, if the mission to you know the, that probe to Venus that uh, didn't leave the uh, didn't leave orbit never happened. So these things just didn't get mentioned. So um, it looked like the Soviet Union had you know a one hundred percent success record, which was far from the far from the case. Um, but you know to to um, this is how the propaganda game was played back then, and uh, so Kennedy was really looking for something that. Um, you know, the Soviet Union simply, uh, you know, they didn't believe the Soviet Union could top at that time. So a first that America would unequivocally have. Um, because and particularly uh, Khrushchev's thing was always trying to get 
the Soviet achievement in just before the Americans did something. So, you know, like they know, well, we're doing our space, our first spacewalk on Gemini 4. So the, uh, you know, Voshkod 2 was very quickly um, put together to, um, you know, pip the American, or launched to pip the Americans by having the first spacewalk before Gemini 4. And in fact, the, the Voshkod 1 was really put together specifically not just to beat the Americans to a, you know, a, a multi-person spacecraft, i.e. the two, you know, two crew Gemini, but to go one better and have three people in space, uh, which the Americans weren't going to get to till, till Apollo. And of course, they took an incredible risk because although they presented Voshkod as a new spacecraft, it was just literally a Vostok with everything stripped out of it that they could strip out of it to cram three people in there. And in fact, that's why the why the crew actually flew in um, in shirt sleeves, because you couldn't get three people in spacesuits into the into the Vostok, even though it was a lot roomier than than um, a Mercury. You just couldn't get three people in spacesuits in there. So um, yeah, of course the Russians made a thing about oh, you know, our, our technology is so reliable, we don't need spacesuits anymore, you know, and and um, and in fact, one of the reasons that um, the Oktostov flew on that mission was that he was one of the engineers um, who developed the Vostok and was doing the Voshkod modifications. And Khrushchev more or less said, um, well, you know, we're, we're going to appoint you to fly it because if your life's on the line, we know you'll be, um, you know, you'll make sure this mission works. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the, the, um, the, Soviet leader wasn't above um, certainly putting, you know, the lives of um, his own people on the line if it would um, beat the Americans. Okay. Five minutes, which we we don't need to use if you need to get off off there now. Um, we'll still be on for a little while after you after you finished anyway. Yep. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to turn into a pumpkin at this point and leave you if nobody has any more uh, questions.